What drives a child to commit unspeakable acts of evil? In Australia, a shocking handful of young individuals have gone beyond the boundaries of mischief and into the realm of horrifying violence. These aren't just cases of youthful rebellion. They're stories that have left entire communities reeling and the nation asking, how could this happen? From teenagers who orchestrated brutal murders to children whose actions shocked a country, these stories force us to confront the harrowing question. What makes a young mind turn towards evil? Descendant of a notorious serial killer, 17-year-old Matthew Malat brutally murdered his friend in Belanglo State Forest, seeking infamy and perpetuating a violent legacy. This shocking crime, recorded and boasted about, reignited terror linked to the Milot name and the infamous forest. Let's explore the chilling tales of these young individuals behind cold-blooded murders and inexplicable acts of violence. Matthew Mylaw. Matthew Mylaw, a relative of the notorious serial killer Ivan Mylaw, committed a horrific murder at only 17. In 2010, Matthew, along with a partner, deceitfully invited their friend, 17-year-old David Osterloni, to Balanglo State Forest in New South Wales, under the guise of celebrating his birthday. Tragically, this led to David's brutal death at the hands of Matthew, who used an axe in the act. Shockingly, Matthew recorded the murder, later boasting about it to peers, demonstrating a chilling lack of remorse. He disturbingly claimed the act was a bid to perpetuate his notorious family's violent history. The court sentenced Mila to 43 years, condemning his meticulously planned and cruel actions. This crime reignited deep-seated fears surrounding Belanglo Forest, already tainted by Ivan Mila's previous atrocities highlighting the lingering shadow of violence associated with the Milat name and that notorious location. James Vlasakis. James Vlasakis was involved in one of Australia's most horrifying serial murder cases, the Snowtown Bodies and Barrels killings. The crimes were orchestrated by John Bunting and his group, targeting individuals they deemed undesirable. Vlasakis, the youngest member, assisted in at least four murders with victims tortured and killed before being stored in barrels. The killings, driven by a mix of vigilante justice and personal greed, horrified the nation. Masakis' involvement began as a victim of manipulation and abuse by Bunting, but escalated into active participation. He confessed in court and provided testimony that helped convict the other perpetrators, receiving a 26-year sentence. His case highlighted the vulnerability of young individuals to coercion in criminal networks. Eric Smith. At just 13 years old, Eric Smith committed the horrifying murder and sexual assault of four-year-old Derek Joseph Roby. Smith lured the unsuspecting child, who was innocently riding his bicycle, into a nearby wooded area where he strangled him, crushed his skull with a heavy rock, and violated him with a stick. A shocking twist came days later. Smith revealed his dark deed to his mother, and the burdened family alerted authorities. In a historic move, Smith became the youngest individual tried as an adult for murder in New York State. Under scrutiny, his past as a severely bullied loner unraveled, initially diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder and later with ADHD. In 1994, Smith was convicted of second-degree murder, receiving a nine-year sentence. During his time in prison, he expressed remorse on public television. After 27 years, he was granted parole in 2021. His parole hearings unveiled unexpected personal developments, including an engagement to a lawyer two years earlier. Smith was ultimately freed on February 1, 2022, after confirming a stable residence. While anger and frustration fueled Smith's horrific crime, the motivations behind another child's murderous acts proved to be equally as chilling and disturbingly unexpected. Brenda Ann Spencer. At just 13, Brenda Spencer unleashed chaos from her home strategically positioned across the street from a school. On the otherwise ordinary Monday morning of January 29, 1979, she fired at students gathering at the school entrance, tragically killing two and injuring eight others, as well as a police officer named Robert Robb. In an urgent effort to stop the rampage, police cleverly maneuvered a garbage truck to block her line of fire. After discharging her weapon 36 times, Spencer retreated to her home, remaining holed up for hours. When asked by a reporter about her motive, 
Spencer chillingly replied that she shot at the children simply because she disliked Mondays and wanted to liven up the day. Charged as an adult, she pled guilty to two counts of murder and assault with a deadly weapon, receiving concurrent sentences of 25 years to life in prison. Though eligible for parole as early as 1993, Spencer showed a disturbing preference for being shot by police over seeking freedom. During her 2001 parole hearing, she accused her father of physical and sexual abuse, claims that remained unverified. Her parole request was denied, with the board deciding she wouldn't be reconsidered until 2025. Gosh to Joshua Phillips. At the tender age of 14, Joshua Phillips committed a shocking crime against his eight-year-old friend and neighbor, Maddie Clifton. Their game of baseball took a tragic turn when Phillips accidentally struck Maddie in the eye with the ball, causing her to bleed, cry, and scream. In a state of panic, Phillips dragged her into his house. Desperate to silence her cries, he struck her with a baseball bat and then concealed her body under his bed. Upon his father's return home, Phillips briefly interacted with him. But when he returned to his room, he discovered Maddie was still alive, faintly moaning beneath the bed. Acting in fear, he removed the mattress and in a chilling act, he slit her throat and stabbed her in the chest, ending her life. For seven agonizing days, Maddie's whereabouts remained a mystery until Phillips' mother stumbled upon the gruesome scene in her son's room and alerted the authorities. Phillips was arrested and confessed to the heinous act. Tried as an adult but under the age of 16, he received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In prison, Phillips took on the role of a paralegal, helping fellow inmates with their appeals. Despite his show of remorse, he refrained from sending a written apology to Maddie's family, insisting on apologizing in person to convey his sincerity. Sadly, his requests for appeal have been repeatedly denied. Michael Hernandez At 14, Michael Hernandez's fascination with serial killers turned into a dark fixation. He immersed himself online, absorbing every disturbing detail of their crimes, and resolved to walk a similar path. On an ill-fated day in 2004, equipped with a knife, gloves, and an oversized jacket, Hernandez set off to school, targeting a certain victim. When his initial attempt to lure this student into the bathroom failed, he remained resolute and set his sights on another. This time, his friend Jamie Goff, also 14, agreed to follow him to the bathroom. Without warning, Hernandez viciously attacked, stabbing Guff 42 times and slicing his throat. Despite cleaning up meticulously, traces of blood on his hands caught a teacher's eye, prompting a call to the police. A thorough search of Hernandez's home unearthed a chilling journal with a kill list, featuring the names of several intended victims, including his sister. Although he pleaded not guilty because of insanity, the court rejected this defense and he received a life sentence in 2008. Tragically, in 2021, Hernandez died from cardiac dysrhythmia, attributed to morbid obesity, while imprisoned at Columbia Correctional Facility. John Venables and Robert Thompson. On February 12, 1993, two 10-year-old boys, Robert Thompson and John Venables, committed a chilling crime that shocked the nation by abducting, torturing, and murdering two-year-old James Patrick Bulger. The incident began when Bulger's mother momentarily released his hand to purchase at a shopping mall. Seizing this opportunity, Thompson and Venables led the toddler away, initially dropping him on his head by a canal, causing facial injuries. As they disturbingly joked about their actions, the boys eventually took Bulger to a railway track where his life ended tragically under a train. Unbeknownst to them, CCTV cameras captured the moment they led Bulger out of the mall. The evidence led to their swift arrest and subsequent charges of murder, marking them as the youngest murderers of the 20th century. After their trial, Thompson was detained at the Barton Moss Secure Children's Home, while Venables was held at a different facility. In 2001, both were released on lifelong licenses, each receiving new identities and relocated in a witness protection-like program. Mary Bell. In a chilling tale from Newcastle, 10-year-old Mary Bell made headlines when she strangled her first victim, four-year-old Martin Brown, in an abandoned house. The discovery of an empty bottle of painkillers nearby led police to mistakenly conclude that the boy had died from an accidental overdose. Undeterred, Mary and her friend, Norma Bell, unrelated to Mary, despite their shared surname, broke into a school shortly after. 
leaving behind a trail of vandalism and confession notes admitting to Brown's death. The authorities dismissed these confessions as childish pranks rather than taking them seriously. The duo's malevolent streak escalated when they brutally killed and mutilated three-year-old Brian Howe. Mary even attempted to harm several other children, but her plans were thwarted when the police finally apprehended her. Convicted of manslaughter rather than murder, Mary's trial revealed her troubled psyche, with court psychiatrists arguing her actions were driven by self-defense psychopathy, absolving her of full responsibility. Mary's early life was a harrowing story of neglect and exploitation. With a mother who forced her into sex work from a tender age and a failed adoption attempt. Sentenced to Her Majesty's Pleasure, she served 12 years before her release in 1980, supposedly rehabilitated. While Mary eventually walked free, the dark chain of events she initiated serves as a grim reminder of the sinister possibilities within even the youngest among us. Craig Price Between the ages of 13 and 15, Craig Price committed four notorious murders in his community marking him as the youngest serial killer in U.S. history. His violent spree began in 1987, when he broke into a neighbor's home and brutally murdered 27-year-old Rebecca Spencer by stabbing her 58 times. This horrific act was his first murder. Two years later, he killed another woman and her two daughters, cementing his grim place in history. Before these heinous acts, Price had been arrested for petty theft. Upon his arrest, Price confessed to his crimes and was tried and convicted as a minor. Alarmingly, he even boasted about his notorious status during and after his trial. His time in prison was turbulent. He was involved in multiple violent incidents, including fights that led to additional charges. In 2009, Price was denied parole due to his continued violent behavior, including an altercation where he injured a correctional officer with a handmade shiv resulting in his transfer to a different facility. Price's violent streak continued with another attack in 2017, where he stabbed fellow inmate Joshua Davis using a five-inch homemade knife. This incident led to an additional 25-year sentence, further delaying his release, which had been initially set for May 2020. Price's murders were driven by an uncontrolled fury, a stark contrast to another young offender, whose actions stemmed from anger and rejection. Craig Price's story serves as a chilling reminder of the destructive power of unchecked rage and the devastating impact it can have on individuals and their communities. His life offers a cautionary tale about the potential for violence and the consequences of early criminal behavior. Brandon McInerney In 2008, a tragic event unfolded at E.O. Green Junior High School in Oxnard, California as 14-year-old Brandon McInerney fatally shot his classmate, 15-year-old Lawrence King. This devastating incident followed an encounter where King had reportedly asked McInerney to be his valentine in front of their basketball teammates, leading to teasing and ridicule directed at McInerney. Humiliated and angry, McInerney vowed to take drastic action. During a class in the computer lab, McInerney pulled a .22 caliber revolver from his backpack and shot King twice in the back of the head. King was immediately rushed to the hospital and placed on life support, but succumbed to his injuries two days later. McInerney was arrested shortly after the shooting and the legal proceedings began, marked by numerous delays. After an extended legal process, McInerney's trial commenced. On November 21, 2011, he pled guilty to second-degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, and use of a firearm. He received a sentence of 21 years in prison, with no credit given for time served before the trial or for good behavior. Initially held in a juvenile facility, McInerney was transferred to an adult prison upon turning 18. As of March 2023, he remains incarcerated at Folsom State Prison. The shocking violence McInerney directed at King reverberated through the community, serving as a stark reminder of the severe consequences of unchecked emotions and social intolerance. His actions not only ended a life, but also shattered the peace of his school and community. Nathaniel Abraham, Nathaniel Abraham garnered national attention when he became one of the youngest individuals in the United States to be convicted of murder as an adult at just 11 years old. The incident occurred in 1997 when Nathaniel shot 18-year-old Ronnie Green. Green was standing outside a party store when a single .22 caliber bullet to the head struck him. Tragically, he succumbed to his injuries the following day. 
Nathaniel admitted to firing a rifle toward the store on the day of the incident. Still, he insisted that he had no intention of harming anyone, claiming he was merely shooting at trees. Despite Nathaniel's assertion that the shooting was unintentional, prosecutors painted a different picture. They argued that Nathaniel had intentionally set out to kill and had even boasted about the shooting afterward. It was revealed that he had expressed a wish to kill his girlfriend days before the tragic incident occurred. This led to Nathaniel facing serious charges, including first-degree and second-degree murder, along with multiple other felonies. He was tried as an adult, making him one of the youngest Americans to face such charges in adult court. Ultimately, the judge sentenced Nathaniel to a maximum security juvenile detention center, ordering his release upon reaching 21. This decision emphasized both the severity of the crime and Nathaniel's young age at the time. He was released in 2007. However, his release did not mark the end of his encounters with the law. Nathaniel was subsequently arrested multiple times for various offenses, including drug possession and other felonies. Nathaniel Abraham's case stands as a somber reminder of the severe consequences youthful rage and poor decisions can have on a community. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, Columbine. On April 20th, 1999, the tranquility of Columbine, Colorado was shattered when high school seniors Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold unleashed a meticulously planned attack at Columbine High School. Their actions led to the tragic deaths of 12 students and one teacher, with 24 others injured. The pair had forged a close bond since meeting in seventh grade, becoming nearly inseparable by their junior year. A year before this horrific event, Harris and Klebold faced legal trouble for breaking into a van to steal electronic equipment. They were fortunate to have their criminal records expunged upon completing a diversionary program designed for rehabilitation, a decision that cleared their past misdeeds. On the day of the attack, just weeks before their impending graduation, Harris and Klebold arrived at the school wearing black trench coats, concealing their deadly intentions. They planned to detonate two 20-pound propane bombs in the cafeteria, intending to cause maximum devastation. Their plan included shooting, stabbing, and throwing bombs at any survivors from their parked cars. Additional bombs were set in their vehicles to target first responders who rushed to the chaotic scene. When their bombs failed to explode, the pair resorted to a shooting spree inside the school. The shocking assault ended with Harris and Klebold taking their own lives that afternoon leaving the nation grappling with the aftermath of their violence. The brutal massacre ignited a nationwide discourse on the underlying causes of such violence, pushing for preventative measures to avert future tragedies. Despite the notoriety Harris and Klebold gained from their actions, the horror of their crime remains a grim reminder of the potential for unimaginable violence, echoing through communities and sparking discussions on safety and mental health among youths. Paula R. Cooper at just 15 years old, Paula was involved in the brutal murder of 77-year-old Ruth Pelkey in her Indiana home. Paula, along with three friends, had skipped school, consumed alcohol, and smoked marijuana before visiting Ruth Pelkey, under the pretense of inquiring about Bible lessons. The visit turned deadly when one of Paula's friends struck Pelkey with a flower vase, leading Paula to inflict further harm by cutting Pelka's arms and legs. In a horrific escalation, Paula stabbed Pelkey 33 times with a butcher knife, afterwards stealing $10 and Pelka's 1976 Plymouth car. The group was soon arrested. During the trial, Paula's defense team described her as a victim of abuse, but this narrative didn't prevent her and her friends from receiving sentences ranging from 25 to 60 years for their participation in the crime. While at a juvenile center following her arrest, Paula exhibited violent behavior, attacking guards. Consequently, she was transferred to the county jail, where reports emerged of her bragging about her crime and expressing intentions to repeat it. Initially, Paula was sentenced to death, but a Supreme Court ruling prohibiting the death penalty for those under 16 at the time of their crime led to her sentence being reduced to life imprisonment. Tragically, Paula died in 2015 in an apparent suicide occurring two years after her release from Rockville Correctional Facility. Her horrifying crime against an elderly neighbor shocked the local community, drawing attention to the violent capabilities of young offenders. Jake Evans. 
In 2012, a tragic crime occurred when a 17-year-old from Parker County fatally shot his mother and 15-year-old sister. On that tragic day, the teen called 911 and confessed to the dispatcher, saying, Ah, I just killed my mom and my sister. I felt like they were just suffocating me. Evans was promptly arrested at the scene, where he had contacted authorities after the shootings. In a statement to investigators, Evans revealed a disturbing plan to kill several relatives, which he conceived after watching Rob Zombie's remake of the movie Halloween, featuring a boy who murders his family. He seemed to have viewed this act as a perverse form of entertainment. However, after carrying out the murders, he was overcome with shock and fear. The gun used, stolen from his grandfather, a retired Fort Worth officer, was left on the kitchen counter before Evans called 911. Jasmine Richardson In April 2006, 12-year-old Jasmine Richardson shocked Canada by becoming the youngest person convicted of multiple first-degree murders after killing three members of her family in Medicine Hat, Alberta. The murders were committed with her 23-year-old boyfriend, Jeremy Steinke, whom her parents had forbidden her from seeing due to their significant age difference. The catalyst for this brutal crime was reportedly Jasmine's grounding imposed by her parents to end the relationship. Feeling trapped, Jasmine hatched a plan to murder her parents and younger brother. After the murders, authorities arrested Jasmine when they found her missing the following day. In 2007, Jasmine was sentenced to 10 years, the maximum penalty possible for someone of her age. This sentence included credit for the 18 months she had already spent in custody, followed by four years in a psychiatric institution and four and a half years under conditional community supervision. Jeremy Steinke, her accomplice, received three concurrent life sentences and is only eligible for parole after serving 25 years. Jasmine's case raised concerns about how to handle young offenders of such violent crimes and highlighted gaps in preventive measures. By May 2016, Jasmine had completed her sentence and was released from all court-imposed conditions and supervision. While she regained her freedom, the community remains haunted by the chilling murders she orchestrated. Rachel, Schaff, and Shelia, Eddie. When 16-year-old Skylar Niece disappeared on July 6, 2012, her two closest friends, Rachel Schoff and Shelia Eddy, took to social media, expressing their deep concerns and hopes for her safe return. Yet, in a shocking turn of events, investigators later uncovered that Schoff and Eddy were responsible for Skylar's death. The investigation revealed that tensions had been brewing among the three girls before Skylar's disappearance. In the days leading up to her death, Skylar posted tweets hinting at her frustration and mistrust, including, it really doesn't take much to piss me off, and another alluding to her loss of trust in someone close. Surveillance footage revealed Skylar getting into a car on the night she vanished, later identified as belonging to one of the girls. Months later, Rachel Shove confessed that she and Shelia Eddy had brutally stabbed Skylar to death. In court, Eddy pleaded guilty to first-degree murder, and received a life sentence on January 24, 2014, about 18 months after Skyler's death. Schoff pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 30 years in prison. During the proceedings, only Schoff expressed remorse, offering an apology to Skyler's grieving family, Anissa Wire and Morgan Geyser. On May 31, 2014, in Waukesha, Wisconsin, Two 12-year-old girls, Anissa Wire and Morgan Geyser, committed a shocking crime by luring their friend, Peyton Leutner, into a wooded area of a local park and stabbing her 19 times. Their motive was unsettling. They believed their actions would appease Slenderman, a fictional horror character. Slenderman, known for his unnaturally tall, thin figure and featureless face, originated from an online forum, Something Awful, during a 2009 paranormal image Photoshop contest. This character is often depicted lurking in forests, causing amnesia, paranoia, and other disturbing effects on his victims. Geyser faced charges of attempted first-degree homicide, while Weyer was charged with attempted second-degree homicide. Due to the severity of their crimes, both girls were tried as adults, despite their young age. Byer ultimately received a sentence of 25 years to life, while Geyser was given the maximum sentence of 40 years to life. Interestingly, Byer demonstrated remorse for her actions, and in a 2021 hearing, she was released under numerous conditions, 
These included 24-hour GPS monitoring, restrictions on our internet use, and a ban from social media platforms. Geyser is still serving her sentence. The horrific attack by Vire and Geyser underscores the dark potential for violence among friends. Their case and subsequent sentencing highlight the complexities involved in dealing with juvenile offenders who commit grave crimes, raising questions about the balance between punishment, rehabilitation, and preventing future tragedies. Cindy Collier and Shirley Wolfe. In 1988, Cindy Collier, 15, and Shirley Wolfe, 14, knocked on the door of 86-year-old Anna Brackett in Auburn. The elderly woman welcomed them in, and after about an hour of small talk, Collier handed one of Brackett's kitchen knives to Wolfe, who then stabbed Brackett at least 27 times. Due to juvenile sentencing laws of the time, both Collier and Wolfe were sentenced to remain in the California Youth Authority facility until they turned 27. During her imprisonment, Wolfe had several legal issues, including crashing a fire truck into a fence during an escape attempt and trying to assault two jailers at Ventura County Jail. Collier, on the other hand, earned a junior college degree in law while in the juvenile facility and was paroled in 1992. Her last known residence was in Northern California. After her release, Wolf became involved in programs aiding victims of child abuse and is known to be active in her church. It was reported that Wolf had endured years of sexual and physical abuse, starting at age two when her father began molesting her, a crime for which he would later serve a 100-day prison sentence. Alyssa Bustamante. On October 21, 2009, in St. Martins, Missouri, 15-year-old Alyssa Bustamante tragically murdered her nine-year-old neighbor, Elizabeth Olton. Bustamante lured Olton into the woods, where she strangled and stabbed her to death. After committing the murder, Bustamante attended a church dance while police searched for the missing girl. On November 17, 2009, Bustamante made her first court appearance, pleading not guilty to charges of first-degree murder and armed criminal action. She had used a knife in the attack. Three years later, she accepted a plea deal, reducing her charges to second-degree murder and armed criminal action. Consequently, she was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of conditional release, along with an additional consecutive 30-year sentence for armed criminal action. In 2014, Bustamante's appeal against her sentence was denied. Meanwhile, a lawsuit filed by the victim's mother, Patricia Price, resulted in a settlement. As part of the agreement, Bustamante was required to disclose any compensation gained from coverage of the case to Price. Mental health professionals who evaluated Bustamante later testified that she suffered from major depressive disorder and borderline personality disorder, highlighting underlying issues that may have influenced her actions. Thomas J. Lane. On the morning of February 27, 2012, Chardon High School in Chardon, Ohio, became the scene of a tragic shooting where six students were hit by gunfire, leading to three fatalities. Among the wounded, two were hospitalized, with one suffering permanent paralysis, while another sustained only minor injuries, and the sixth received a superficial wound. The shooter was identified as 17-year-old Thomas J. Lane, a former Chardon High student. It was reported that Lane had a personal rivalry with one of his victims. After the shooting, Lane was quickly apprehended by police and faced charges, including three counts of aggravated murder, two counts of attempted aggravated murder, and one count of felonious assault. Initially detained as a juvenile due to his age, a judge later found Lane competent to stand trial and opted to charge him as an adult. In 2013, Lane pleaded guilty and was sentenced to three consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. A year later, Lane, along with two older inmates, managed to escape from prison, but was captured the next day and transferred to a maximum security facility. Lane's actions, driven by personal rivalry, underscore the devastating impact of unresolved conflicts. Graham Young, known as the Teacup Poisoner, Graham Young was an English serial killer, infamous for his use of poison to eliminate his victims. His fascination with toxic substances began at a young age, leading him to poison the food and drinks of his relatives and school friends. His sinister activities were halted when a perceptive teacher caught on and alerted the police. At just 14, Young was arrested and confessed to three non-fatal poisoning incidents. He spent the next nine years of his life detained at Broadmoor Hospital. 
Released in 1971, Young secured a job in a factory where he resumed his deadly hobby, resulting in two deaths and several severe illnesses among colleagues. In the ensuing year, Young was found guilty of two murders and two attempted murders. He spent the majority of his life sentenced at H.M. Prison Parkhurst, where he passed away from a heart attack in 1990. His chilling story inspired the 1995 film The Young Poisoner's Handbook and even influenced a 16-year-old Japanese schoolgirl who was arrested for using thallium to poison her mother. These unsettling tales serve as stark reminders that malice knows no age limit. For more intriguing stories, subscribe to our channel.